Welcome to Harvest Point. 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 We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. We're glad you're here. Welcome to Harvest Point. We're glad you're here. I'm Pastor Kevin. Just so you know, for your convenience, at any time during the service, if you have a child or children with you, and they have any needs, or if they get anxious or restless, and you need to take them out of the service, just know you can exit the sanctuary, take a left, go down the hall, and our first room on the left is our mother's room. Feel free to use that at your convenience. There's a TV in there that'll be live streaming the service. There's a changing table and some recliners for all of your baby needs. Also, we have some restrooms further down the hall to the left. You'll find your men's and women's bathrooms. Thank you again for being here. Let's worship the risen King. All right, I'm gonna read some scripture from Luke 24, verses one through three. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. All right, let's stand and worship.
Because there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown Cause there's nobody in the grave now No enemy can hold you down Cause there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown Cause there's nobody in the grave now No enemy can hold you down Cause there's nobody in the grave now One head gets to wear that crown Give it praise this morning. I don't know about that. Nine o'clock whipped y'all with the welcome. Let's try it again. Of course, nine o'clock, we were super packed. So let's try it again, though. Morning. Morning. How y'all doing? Good. Good. All right, listen, we're here to celebrate the risen Jesus. Okay? We're not here for a program. We're not here as a religious exercise or just a tradition that we do on Easter. We're literally here to, because we believe that Jesus rose from the grave, right? So, yeah. So let me, let me pray and uh, just ask the Lord to meet with us. And then I'm going to finish the scripture Chuck started before we sang nobody. Lord, uh, we are here to worship you. We're not here because it's a national holiday. We're not here for a bunny or eggs or tradition and lunch and all that stuff, Lord. We are here because it's Resurrection Day, and this is the day that we are celebrating specifically the resurrection, Lord. And so we thank you and we worship you and we praise you, Jesus. You're alive. You are alive. And we are here to respond to that truth. So I just ask that you'd forgive us of our sins. Please meet with us this morning, Father, and by your spirit, work in hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in cloths that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Let me pray for just a second. We'll get into that. Father, we just pray and ask that your will be done here. God, that you be glorified. We ask, Father, that you just have your way in our hearts, in our minds, Lord, as we worship you this morning. We pray and ask that your will be done. And it's in Jesus' awesome, holy living name that we pray. Amen. 
So we're going to do something a little different from the first service. All right, y'all cool with that? Okay, we're going to sing this song. And we're going to call this an acoustic version, okay? So we want you to sing it with us. It goes like this. A great light dawns in Galilee And some say madam and some say king a wonder working rebel priest in Jesus Christ the Nazarene and he knew well what it would take to free us all from sin and grave a perfect man would have to die only he could pay that price Friday's good cause Sunday is coming And don't lose hope cause Sunday is coming Devil you're done, you better start running Oh Friday's good cause Sunday is coming So he let those soldiers take him in As his friend betrayed him with a kiss And there before the mocking crowd Like a lamb to the slaughter didn't make a sound Then he carried that cross to Calvary and he shed his blood to set us free As the nails went in the sky went dark The redemption of the world was on his heart Well Friday's good cause Sunday's coming And don't lose hope cause Sunday's coming Devil, you're done, you better start running Friday's good, cause Sunday's coming Then he breathed his last And then he breathed his last He bowed his head The Son of God in man was dead with bloody hands and tears on their face well, they laid him down inside that grave but that wasn't the end Come on now. no that, that wasn't the end and that wasn't the end let me tell you what happened next the women came before the dawn They looked inside the angel said Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's alive, he's alive Hallelujah, he is alive Give him praise, lift him high Hallelujah, he is alive, he's alive, he's alive Hallelujah, he is alive Give him praise, lift him high Jesus reigns upon the throne all heaven sings to him alone but we watch and wait like a bride for a groom 
Oh, church, arise. He's coming soon. i 
clap of praise. Dear Father, this morning we are so thankful. We are so thankful for what you have done for us, Lord. That we were cut off from a relationship with you because of our sin, Lord. But you didn't leave us like that. You sent Jesus. You sent Jesus to be the price for our sin. To live the perfect life that we were not capable of living on our own. He did that. And he died the death that each and every single one of us deserve, Lord. Just so that we could be reconciled with you. And this morning, we praise you that he rose from the grave, that he is alive. And because of that, we can rejoice and we can celebrate. And Lord, this morning, I just pray that everybody will be just so thankful for that, Lord. I pray for the people that are here that need to be saved, Lord. I pray that you would speak to their hearts and that your Holy Spirit would do a work in their lives. And I pray that you would just be praised and glorified in everything that is said and done here this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> All right, well, here we are, Easter, 11 o'clock service. <laughs> I mean, wasn't really fishing for that, but at least we were going to give that. It should have been a little, you know, a little stronger. But here we go, Easter. I'll let you all guess what we're going to talk about today. Tithing, yes. All right, everybody grab your wallet. You're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I didn't sign up for all this. And, you know, don't, don't talk about all that, Kev. So um, we are obviously going to talk about the resurrection, okay? And let me make a very clear declaration uh, as we start. Those of us in this room that have trusted in Jesus Christ, we believe what we preach and what we sing. To you, it may sound crazy to believe that a man 2,000 years ago was murdered and then he got up out of the grave. But based on evidence and historical narrative, we choose to place our faith in that because he wasn't just a man. He was actually God, the creator in human flesh. And so I just want to make the declaration right now, because I know we got some visitors, and I know some of y'all, you came because, you know, your buddy invited you, your mom begged you to come, and you don't subscribe to the whole Christianity thing, okay? Well, well we'd like to welcome you. Like, first of all, we're glad you're here. Um, but make no mistake, we absolutely believe that Jesus Christ was and is God in human flesh, died for the sins of the world, and rose out of the grave three days later, Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. Now, we've been in a series called Road to Resurrection. And what we've been doing in this series is we've been looking at some events in Jesus' life that led up to the resurrection. And a few weeks ago, we looked where Jesus told his disciples three different times in the book of Mark that he would die and rise again. And, you know, we don't want to be too hard on the disciples because I feel like most of us would have been in their shoes. But Jesus plainly told them, I'm going to be handed over, I'm going to be murdered, I'm going to rise from the grave. And the disciples were like, uh, what? They just didn't get it. They didn't like that plan. They didn't get that plan. They, didn't, they just weren't with it, right? So we talked about that a few weeks ago. And then last week, we looked at what's known in Christianity as the triumphal entry. It's where Jesus rode a donkey uh, into the city of Jerusalem. People were saying Hosanna and praising him, throwing their jackets down in front of his donkey to walk on. It would be the equivalent of today's red carpet rolled out. Um, people are praising him. Pra and, and what I need you to know, if you're not familiar with the triumphal entry, is that happened on a Sunday. He was five days away from being crucified seven days away from the resurrection. And so we looked at that last week and the implications of the triumphal entry and that Jesus is the king. And we just kind of questioned ourselves how we respond to that truth. Um, and then today we're going to uh, kind of 
bring it to an end as we look at the actual resurrection. So what we're going to do is I'm going to run quickly through some events that happened during the last week of Jesus' life. It's called the Passion Week. We'll talk about what happened Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then we'll really focus on what happened Friday morning on a cross and then three days later on Sunday. Okay, so if you've got your Bible, open it up to Mark chapter 15. That's where we'll spend most of our time this morning, in Mark chapter 15 and 16. And uh, again, we're just going to kind of document Jesus' road to the cross and then his resurrection, okay? Let me pray for us, and then we'll start. Lord, I pray that uh, by your spirit and the power of your word that uh, you would captivate our focus and attention this morning, and that, Lord, you'd work in our hearts. And may you be raised high, Jesus, and glorified above all this morning. And uh, Lord, we ask that you meet with us now during our time in your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So again, let me run it back for a second. Jesus has lived 33 years on this earth. God in human flesh came and lived. Was born of a virgin, right? He grew, lived 33 years. The last three years of his life, he was doing ministry. But what we know about his life is for all 33 or so years that he lived, he was what we call sinless. He was perfect. He was righteous. He lived perfectly. Now, can anybody make that claim in here? Yes, Kev, I am perfect. Now, let me, if you raise your hand, you're a liar, (laughs) which means you're not perfect, okay? Jesus even made the claim that he was without sin in front of his enemies. Like, I don't know about y'all, but I got some people that don't care too much for me. And they've maybe seen me at my worst. And if I were to dare say, hey, I've never done anything wrong, my enemies would be like, yeah, what about that time you said this? What about that time you did that? What about that attitude you had at this point? Jesus said plainly in front of his enemies, I'm sinless. You know what his enemies said? Nothing. Nothing. They couldn't even accuse him because he was sinless. Jesus lived his life and he met God's standard of moral perfection. And so he lived totally righteous for 33 years. And now here we are at the last week of his life. Sunday, he rides in on the donkey at the triumphal entry. People are praising him, saying, Hosanna. Monday, and and here's how it it happened. Jesus would enter Jerusalem in the mornings and he'd spend most of the day there. Then he'd leave the city and he'd cross over this little valley called the Kidron Valley and he'd start heading up the mountain. It's called the Mount of Olives, right across from the city of Jerusalem. And he was staying in a little village called Bethany with his friends, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So he rides in on Sunday spends some time Sunday in Jerusalem, leaves Jerusalem Sunday evening, goes back to Martha, Mary, and Lazarus' house. He gets up Monday morning, he and his disciples, they head back into Jerusalem, and on the way, he curses a fig tree, and then when he gets in there, he goes to the temple courts. Now, if you know anything about what was going on at the temple courts, um, there was lots and lots and lots of religious fakery going on, okay? Okay. There were people gouging people um, for money and making a profit. There was a lot of consumerism going on, and uh, Jesus didn't like that. Jesus was filled with righteous anger, and you know what Jesus did? He flipped tables, and he cleared the temple of all the nonsense going on. That was supposed to be a house of prayer. They'd made it a den of thievery, robbers, criminals. And so Jesus goes in Monday clears the temple, spends some time, leaves again, goes back to Bethany, wakes up Tuesday morning, comes back into Jerusalem, and on his way there, by the way, the disciples see the fig tree cursed, and it's withered. He gets into town Tuesday, and uh, he's confronted by some of the religious people, uh, the religious leaders. They didn't like what Jesus was doing. He was a threat to their religion and their tradition, and they tried to confront Jesus. They tried to, they tried to trick him. They tried to put him on front street. They tried to trap him, and it was to no avail because you can't trick or trap God in human flesh. Really, Jesus ended up turning the trap around onto them. And so as Jesus is leaving Tuesday, he starts telling the disciples about what's known as the second coming. 
They're like, hey, what's it going to be like at, at when this happens? And he starts telling them wars and rumors of wars and people will betray one another and this will happen and this sign in the heavens, it's called the Olivet Discourse. That happened on Tuesday heading back outside of Jerusalem. Wednesday, uh, they're back in town and uh, the plot to kill him really starts coming to a head. Judas has decided to betray Jesus to the religious leaders and the whole thing is just a conspiracy against Jesus. The Jewish leaders didn't like it because he was pushing against their man-made religion. And so they whip up a plan to have Jesus murdered. Thursday, he comes into town, and the Jewish people were celebrating what was known as, as Passover. It was a feast that they did annually, and Jesus and his disciples participated in it. And that was the last legit Passover meal. Now we call that the Last Supper. That was Thursday evening. After they partake in the Last Supper, Jesus and his disciples are hanging out in this room. Jesus washes their feet. He's teaching them some things. And uh, they get up and leave that room, and they head across the street, or really across the, the valley, to this garden called Gethsemane, where Jesus wants to spend some time in prayer because he knows he's about to be betrayed and hung on a cross. So he and his disciples head to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus spends some time praying. Um, he asks the disciples to pray with him, and uh, they're a lot more like us than we think because uh, they started praying and <sighs> knocked out, right? I know a lot of people are like, yeah, I try to pray at night when I lay down and go to sleep, and I just am praying, and, uh, and it's like, yeah, that's typical. The disciples even did that. And so Jesus is praying for hours in the garden. He finally wakes his disciples up. Judas shows up with the Jewish leaders and some Roman soldiers, and they're there to uh, arrest Jesus. Judas betrays Jesus, kisses him on the cheek, and uh, Jesus is arrested and then taken from the garden, and he goes through six trials, mock trials, we'll call them, overnight, Thursday night into Friday morning where Jesus has three Jewish trials where he stands before the Jewish leaders. And uh, again, it's a bunch of, they just make up a bunch of stuff to try to convict Jesus. Then Jesus goes before the Romans three times. He goes before Pilate, who was the governor of Judea. And Pilate's like, I mean, I don't know what's wrong with y'all. Like this guy ain't really done nothing. Plus he's from Galilee up north. Like let the governor of Galilee decide what to do. So Pilate tries to push Jesus in this case off to uh, the, the, patri or the uh, uh, governor Herod. And so Herod's like, I mean, I don't know. I mean, he's in Galilee, send him back to Pilate. They send him back to Pilate. Finally, Pilate's like, I don't find any fault in this guy. Like, why, are why do y'all have him here? And the Jewish people start yelling, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate's like, I mean, why? He's done no wrong. Well, the Jewish people become very manipulative. And they know that Pilate has had a couple run-ins with the emperor of Rome. See, the emperor, he was the top dog in the Roman Empire governmental structure. Pilate was just a governor under him. He's had two run-ins with the emperor before, and the emperor told him, if anything else happens down there in Israel and you, under your jurisdiction, you're removed from office, and I'm probably going to behead you. The Jewish people knew that, so they wanted to try to manipulate Pilate to kill Jesus. So you know what they start saying? You're no friend of Caesar. You're no friend of the emperor. That was a veiled threat that they were going to start an uproar. And Pilate was like, oh, they can't start an uproar. I'll lose my life if they do. So Pilate's like, fine, fine. Y'all want this guy punished? I'm going to punish him. And the first form of punishment that's pronounced on Jesus from John chapter 19, verse 1, Jesus was flogged said Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, or some of your Bibles may say scourged. Scourged just means severe flogging. You say, well, what is it to be scourged or flogged, Kev? I mean, why doesn't the Bible give us detail of what, what that entails? Well, again, think back. The original recipients of the Gospel of John, the original readers of this Gospel, they had seen men flogged before. They didn't need an explanation. They didn't need any detail. They knew what it was to be scourged because once you see somebody scourged or flogged, it doesn't leave your mind. It haunts you. And so very simply, John just says, Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Flogging was a form of punishment. It was kind of a, it was a form of punishment uh, handed down and it was used to really create terror and fear among the people. 
because they would do it in a public setting. And that way people could see it and be like, well, I don't need to break the law because I don't want that to happen to me. So they used flogging to punish the criminal, but also to show the, the outsiders and bystanders what happens to criminals. And it was really used to begin the death process. And so what they would do is they'd take a criminal and they'd put him right in a public setting outside for everybody to see. So this was done with no regard to personal dignity. It was very shameful to be flogged. It was, uh, again, done in front of everybody. This would be the equivalent of being punished down in Market Square one Friday evening with it being live simulcasted on the Internet. Everybody could see it. And so they'd take the criminal outside in public and they would drape the criminal's body over a big stone. And what they would do is they'd stretch the criminal's arms out and tie him at the wrist to a post. The reason they would do this is because it would expose the whole backside of the person. They stripped them of their clothes, totally naked. Now remember, this is supposed to be very shameful. So they'd strip the person naked, drape them over a stone, stretch their arms out, tie their wrists to a post, and their whole backside would be exposed and, and tight. And they would take what was known as a cat of nine tails. There would be two Roman soldiers, one on either side of the criminal who was tied and stretched out, and they had what's known as a cat of nine tails. This was a, a small wooden handle that the soldier could grip by, and then there was nine pieces of leather strap connected to this handle. And what made this so awful and so painful was that woven into these straps were heavy pieces of metal or heavy pieces of rock, and at the end of each strap, they would tie or connect pieces of bone or glass to the end of every strap. And so they would stretch the criminal out over this stone and have a Roman soldier on either side. And then the Roman soldier, first Roman soldier, would take it and he would literally whip across the back of the criminal. And they would just alternate lashes. Then this Roman soldier would whip across the back of the criminal. And here's what would happen. The heavy metal pieces and the heavy rock pieces would hit and kind of tenderize the flesh so that the sharp objects could sink in as deeply as possible. And so you have this metal and rock hitting and, and causing like deep contusions at a, at a really deep level. And then the glass and the bone that was tied into the cat of nine tail straps would literally pierce the skin and the organs and, and, and catch under the skin. And then as they ripped back, from the whipping, it would pull chunks of flesh off the person's back. And after a few lashes with this, it would expose muscle and tendons. And after even more lashes, it would actually expose people's organs. There's, there's an ancient uh, history book that actually talks about one man that was flogged or scourged to the point where they hit his back and as they pulled back, a, a part of his rib literally came off with the cat of nine tails and the straps. And so what would that do to a person's body? Well, their heart would immediately go into shock. The, the, the heavy metal pieces and the heavy rock or bone pieces even would cause like deep contusions and tissue damage, and then there'd be lacerations across the back, and it would rip the flesh, and then the muscles would be cut, organs would be cut, and after a few lashes, it would send the person's whole body into shock. It'd be hard to breathe. The lungs would struggle to breathe. Um, the person would experience significant blood loss. The body would be straining to try to keep functioning. Because of the blood loss and the fluid loss and dehydration, the person would be lightheaded. And modern scholars equate scourging or flogging to a modern-day shotgun blast to the back at close range. They said that'd be about the equivalent when it was done. 
And so Jesus is stretched out with Roman soldiers on either side alternating these lashes with these cat and nine tails. He was flogged, and a lot of people died from the flogging. Jesus didn't die from the flogging, but that wasn't the end. And if, as if flogging wasn't enough, look at Mark 15, 16 through 19. It says, the soldiers led Jesus away. This is after they've beaten him and flogged him. They led him away into the palace, that is the praetorium, and called together the whole company of, all, of soldiers. So they get him up. No doubt, again, he's lightheaded, probably close to passing out, going out of consciousness, lots of blood loss. His back looks like he just took a close-range shotgun blast to the back of it. And the soldiers drag him into this palace, and they call the rest of the soldiers together. And look what the soldiers do, verse 17. They put a purple robe on him. Now, how would that feel across his back? Then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on him. Now, Israel's known for these vines that have three to four inch thorns on them. I've seen them. I've been there. And what they did was they took a vine, and they kind of twisted it and probably tied it together. Uh, thorns down, and they place it on his head and push it down. Now, remember who's doing this. This is in the library and at the Carnes uh, Library. These are Roman soldiers. These are mercenaries. They kill for a living. Like, they get pleasure out of this stuff. So I'm sure when they pressed this crown down on his head, this vine, they pushed it as hard as it could until the thorns sunk into his head in verse 18, they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. Remember, they're Romans. They don't subscribe to the Jewish religion or any of this Jewish stuff. They thought the Jewish people were under them because Rome had Israel under occupation and they were ruling in Israel. So these people have no regard for the Jewish religion or anything. So they're just mocking, laughing. Hail, hail King of the Jews. Again and again, they struck him on the head with the staff and spit on him. Falling on their knees, they paid homage to him. Matthew tells us that they actually blindfolded him and were like, hey, tell us who hit you. If you're the big Jewish Messiah and you know everything here, we're going to blindfold you. Who was it that punched you? Take out who was that? And, and, and they're spitting on Jesus. They're talking about Jesus. They're striking him in the head uh, with a reed. They're punching him in the face. They're pulling out his beard. They are literally just mocking and mocking and mocking Jesus to the point where he was so beaten, not only his back, but his face and everything that Isaiah 52, 14 prophesied that when he was beaten like this, he would be unrecognizable. Look at that. Just as there were many who were, who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. This wasn't a little plaything. This was big, nasty, mean Roman soldiers who were hired killers torturing somebody. And what struck me this week as I was studying it is like, and he was their creator. Like he was their creator. And they're sitting there spitting, hitting, beating, torturing the creator. So just jot this down in your sermon notes. Jesus suffered for me. He suffered. He was beaten, flogged, mocked. He suffered. And so if you piece the, sco the story together from Matthew and Luke, what you'll see is, is that after Jesus is flogged and then beaten, mocked, and made fun of, Pilate brings him back out to the crowd, and he's like, look, here's your king. Like, and what he's asking of the Jewish people, what he's really saying is, is this enough? Like, look at him. Y'all wanted him punished. Look at him. And what do the Jewish people say? That ain't enough. Crucify him. And, and Pilate has these, he's like, really? Like, like really? Like, I still find no fault in this guy. You wanted me to punish him? I mean, look at him, and now you want more? Pilate's wife actually comes to him, and she's like, honey, come here. And she pulls him to the side, and she's like, listen, don't have anything to do with this innocent man. Like, I had the craziest dreams last night. I had the, and it wasn't the Taco Bell that we ate. 
I had the craziest dreams last night about this innocent man. Like, you need to leave him alone. Don't do anything more to him. And so Pilate's conflicted because he don't think Jesus has done anything wrong. He doesn't really care what's going on. His wife's telling him not to mess with him. So he walks back out, and the people are still shouting, crucify, crucify. And Jesus was like, really? And they're like, yep. And then again, they threaten that uproar with the emperor. And so Pilate finally just says, okay, he relents. And in Mark 15, verse 20, it says, when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe, put on his own clothes, then they led him out to crucify him. So Pilate's like, okay, then, then crucify him. Crucify him. Now, um, here's what we know about crucifixion. People were crucified on two pieces of wood. Uh, the, the, the piece of wood that would have been standing from the ground, it's known as the stipe, and I just call it the post. And it remained at the location where the person would be crucified. Okay. A lot of people think that Jesus carried the whole cross, the crossbar and the post. He probably didn't because the stipe or the post, it weighed 200 pounds by itself. And so probably what happened was that the post was left at the spot Jesus would have been crucified. But the other part of the cross is known as the patibulum. It's the crossbar, right? And it weighed about 100 pounds. So when we read that Jesus carried his cross to the place where he was going to be crucified, he didn't carry the whole stipe and tibulum, just the uh, patibulum, right? The crossbar. And again, think about that. Wood. Roughly hewn wood. It was rough, jagged wood placed on the back of Jesus who had just been beaten to a pulp. How do you think that felt on his back? And so they put this patibulum on his back and they make him walk outside the city to be crucified. And I've been to Jerusalem. And if you go there today, you can walk the, the route that they believe Jesus walked to go outside the city. It's called the Via Della Rosa. And what the Bible tells us is that Jesus has this patibulum on his back and he's so weak, beaten to the point where he's lost so much blood, he was so dehydrated that on his way through the city, he actually at some point falls under the weight of this crossbar. And so the Roman soldiers are like, you, and they point out this guy, and this guy actually happened to be a believer and follower of Jesus. His name was Simon. He was from Africa. And so Simon comes and helps Jesus carry the patibulum from that point on outside the city of Jerusalem. And so Jesus gets out there to the crucifixion point, and what they would do is they would take the crossbar or patibulum off, and they would lay it across the stipe that was laying on the ground, and they would nail the patibulum to the stipe. Now you have your cross. And next came the crucifixion. So here's what we know about crucifixion. The idea, roughly, of crucifixion uh, and I'll say roughly, I'll explain it in a second. It came about around 800 B.C. by the Persians. And the way the Persians did it, they invented it, but it was more like an impalement. They would take a stick and literally impale a person on it and have them hang there. Uh, several hundred years later, Alexander the Great, the Great actually added the crossbar, the patibulum to this. And then the Romans, whom were crucifying Jesus, they perfected crucifixion. We know that Hitler used crucifixion years ago. We know that uh, crucifixion was used in Cambodia. And we think crucifixion is this thing of the past. But as recently as 2002, there were 88 people crucified in South Africa. Muslims still crucify Christians to this day. It's a mock way to put a Christian to death. You die like your Lord did. And so crucifixion was shameful, right? Again, stripped of their clothes, beaten to a pulp, hung on a cross for people to walk by and spit at and mock and say things to and do other nasty things to that we really don't read a whole lot about in the Bible, but was custom during that time. So it was painful and shameful. It was the most dishonorable way to die. And speaking of how painful it was, I want you to think about this. The pain was so overwhelming of crucifixion 
that we actually have an English word that was created to describe the pain of the crucifixion. The word excruciating. It means intensely painful. And our word excruciating came from the Latin word excrucio. And you know what that word means? From the cross. From the cross. So Jesus now, his body would have been laid on the cross with his head toward the top of the post and his shoulders touching the patibulum and then stretched out. He would have been laid on the cross. His palms would have been placed up as he laid straight on the cross. And they had these five to seven inch, best way I can describe it is railroad nails. Okay? They had these railroad nails, for lack of better terminology, and they would take these nails and secure the criminal, in this case Jesus, to the cross. And most people think that he was secured through his hands, right? But modern studies have showed us that if someone was nailed to a cross right here in the middle of their palm, the rest of the hand couldn't sustain the weight of the body. So it's more likely that when they secured Jesus to the cross, they tied his hands to the patibulum, and then they took these five to seven inch railroad nails and actually drove them through the middle of his wrists. And medical studies have shown us today that right here is the most sensitive nerve centers in the human body. And as soon as they would nail to secure him to the cross, it would cause involuntary twitching in his hands and his arms. And every time his hands would have twitched, it would have sent incredible pain all the way up his arm into his chest from both sides. And we've got this picture here, this, uh, and you can see the, the, the railroad looking nail and you see where they would have nailed Jesus through the wrist and right through a central nerve. Once he was secured up top, they would uh, secure him uh, at his feet. And they would just stack the feet, the right foot over the left foot, and then right in the middle of the foot, they would drive one of these nails again. So the hands were tied and the wrists were nailed, and then the feet were nailed. And we have this pick here. You see how they're stacked onto the stipe, and then the nail driven right through the plantar nerve, the lateral plantar nerve. Now he's secured to the cross. And now that he's secured to the cross, they would have put the cross in place. They would have stood the cross up and kind of dropped it in the hole to secure the cross. And people were crucified really kind of at an eye level. We see movies and we see pictures of Jesus on the cross. And a lot of times it shows him six, seven, eight, ten feet up in the air. That, that wasn't historically accurate. They would actually crucify him maybe a foot or possibly two off the ground. And so people would be close to eye level with him so that when they walked by, they could spit on him, yell at him, mock him. And so they lifted the cross up, put it down into the hole, and then they left the cross there with the body on it until the person died. And a lot of times they would leave the corpse hanging on a cross even after the person had passed away. They'd just leave it there, and they'd let vultures and wild animals come and feast on the, on the corpse. If they were feeling nice, they would remove the, the corpse, and they'd throw it in a hole with other corpses and let it decompose. But that's where the body would stay until the person had passed away. So Jesus is lifted up on the cross now, secured with nails through the wrist and through the feet. His back is bloody, beaten, flesh is gone, his face is disfigured from all the beating from the Roman soldiers, and now he is placed up, stood up on the cross to die. Now we know historically that people could die um, within a few hours of crucifixion, and some would even hang on the cross for three or four days drifting in and out of consciousness. It all depended on the severity of the flogging. And we know Jesus' flogging must have been terrible because he was just on the cross for a matter of hours. Now, people died on the cross, and there are varying kind of reasons people would die. Some people would die from the flogging before they even got 
to the cross. Other people would die on the cross from the elements. If it was cold outside at that time, the elements might get to them. Other people died from heart failure or heart attacks. Uh, some died from dehydration, but most people died from crucifixion, from asphyxiation, from suffocation, right? See, a lot of times we think Jesus was put on the cross and we think crucifixion was they put him on the cross and they beat him and did all this stuff and that's not what happened. Crucifixion was literally you beat them before you secure them to a cross and you just hang them up there until they die. And so I believe Jesus probably died of asphyxiation. And what would happen is with the arms extended and the hands secured and the wrist nailed, what would happen is as the body kind of slouched, you couldn't fill your lungs with air. That's why it was very hard to talk on the cross. If you read about Jesus talking on the cross, he only said one or two little words because it would have been so difficult to get words out because he couldn't get air in his lungs. And so with the body, body slouching and the arms extended, the only way to prolong your life and not suffocate was to push up on the spike through your feet or pull up by the nailed wrist and get you a breath of air. And it was incredibly painful. And so the person on the cross would have to decide, do I want to endure this pain to push up again on this stake to get one more breath or do I not? And if the Roman soldiers had something going on and they wanted to get out of there, if they decided they wanted to speed up the death process, they'd just come by with a club or stick and they would break the leg of the person on the cross. That way they couldn't push up and get a breath. We know historically the Roman soldiers didn't even have to break Jesus' legs because he was dead on the cross. And so what would happen is eventually the body would be unable to push up on the spike through the feet or pull up on the nails through the wrist and the person would just be, be unable to get air in their lungs and they would just suffocate. That's how most people died. And so we read about Jesus' death in Mark 15 starting in verse 33 through 37. It says at noon, so he was probably on the cross at 9 a.m. It's the best guess. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. You're like, what's that mean? I'm glad Mark put what it means in there. Which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So he spoke in Aramaic there and he speaks, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And at that point, he is separated from the Father, cursed. When some of those standing there heard, heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. But they're laughing, oh, he's calling Elijah. Verse 36, someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to, G to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. So why would somebody put a sponge on a stick and offer Jesus a drink? Where'd that come from? Like, why would a Roman soldier be walking around with a sponge and a stick? Well, that was actually part of their ancient field kit that they would walk around with. Y'all know 2,000 years ago, there was no Charmin toilet paper, right? So just logically think that out. They would use a sponge and carry around wine vinegar to act as an antiseptic on the sponge to clean themselves with after the bathroom. So when Jesus said, Mark doesn't document it, but I believe John does, where Jesus says, I thirst or I'm thirsty. And again, in a mocking way, oh, you're thirsty. Here, I got just the drink for you. And they put their ancient toilet paper on a stick and dip it in like, here, taste that. Verse 37, with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Jesus breathed his last. There it is. They didn't even have to break his legs. This proved he was dead. See, there's some skeptics that go, oh, Jesus didn't die on the cross. What happened was he just passed out. He just passed out, and then when they put him in the tomb, like the coolness of the tomb over a few days, it kind of resuscitated, revived him. And he got up and went out of the tomb. He didn't really die. Well, that's, again, we're talking about Roman soldiers who knew what it looked like to be dead. When they got to Jesus to break his legs, they're like, oh, we don't even need to break his legs. 
But what they did do is they took a spear and they shoved it through his side right here between his ribs. And uh, what happened was is, is that when that spear went through the ribs, I'm sure that it punctured his lung. And then the Bible says as they took the spear out, there was blood and water that came out. Why would the Bible say blood and water? What's the clear liquid? It wasn't water. It was actually um, where the spear had pierced the sac that surrounds the heart, the pericardial sac. And medical experts tell us today, if someone gets the pericardial sac around their heart punctured, there's no surviving that. So more than likely, the blood and water, or the blood and clear liquid that came out along with the spear was the puncturing of that pericardial sac of Jesus. So there's no way that he didn't die on the cross. He died. He died on the cross. And so here it is on Friday all the Jewish people were coming with lambs to take to the temple to be slaughtered, to have their sin covered. On Friday, all the lambs were to be killed, and here's the Lamb of God that died for the sins of the world, hanging on the cross, breathing his life. Every single Friday foreshadowed, or every single Passover foreshadowed Good Friday. He breathed his last. Jot this down. Jesus died for me. Not only did he suffer for you and for me, he died for you. You say, for what, man? I don't need to be died for. What, why did Jesus die for me? Well, Isaiah 53, 5 tells us exactly why Jesus died. He was pierced, hands, feet. He was pierced, why? For our transgression, that's sin. That's the wrongdoing that we all do. That's us not meeting the mark and not hitting the standard that God set. He died for our shortcomings, for our failures, for our sin. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace with God was on him, was on Jesus. And the Bible says, by his wounds, the lashes on his back, the cuts on his head, the pierced wrists and feet, the incision in his side, by his wounds, we are healed. That's a spiritual healing, y'all. The payment for our sin came in the death of Jesus. Mark 15, 38 says that the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. There's some theological significance to that. What that shows is, is that at Jesus' death, we had access to God. We know historically that later Friday, uh, a man who had become a follower of Jesus came and took Jesus' body off the tomb. The guy's name was Joseph. He was from a little village called, or really a city called Arimathea. So Joseph comes and takes the corpse of Jesus off the cross, and he takes him to his own gravesite that had been carved out of rock like a shallow a cave, and he takes the corpse of Jesus and lays him in the tomb, and then he rolls a large stone over the entrance to the tomb. And then the Romans come, and they put this cord, and they seal the entrance to the tomb to show that now this is state property. They set a guard of soldiers to come and, and monitor the tomb. That was Friday. You had a pretty quiet Saturday. I can't imagine how the disciples were feeling. All their hope, all their dreams, murdered. Saturday had to be a rough day for the disciples, but Sunday was coming. In Mark 16, 1, we read about the most incredible thing to ever take place in human history. It says, when the Sabbath was over, Saturday's their Sabbath. So after Saturday, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified? He's risen. He's not here. Look, see the place where they laid his body. 
God raised him from the dead. Sunday, by the way, by the way, this is something I always thought when I was little. It's like, oh, oh, okay, the stone was rolled away. What we have to understand is it's not like God had to send an angel to roll the stone away so Jesus could get out of the tomb. The stone was rolled away so that people could get in the tomb and see that he was not there. And so God, all three persons of the Trinity participated in the resurrection. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. The Father who spoke life itself into existence commands life to return to the corpse of his Son. And then the Son, who was the means of creation, takes up life at his command. And the same Spirit that hovered over the waters at the beginning comes into the tomb where the corpse of Jesus is laid, wrapped in grave cloths, and all of a sudden the heart starts to beat. And brain waves begin. And blood starts to course through the veins. And the eyelids start to flutter. And Jesus comes out of the state of death. He comes out of the state of death. He comes out of the grave cloths. He doesn't unwrap himself. He literally comes out and they're laying there as if he was still in. He comes out of the grave cloth. He comes out alive and victorious over death. That's what today's about. He's not just a dead example. He is alive. He's our living Lord. Romans says in Romans 4.25 that he was delivered over to death for our sins, and he was raised to life for our justification. Write this down. Jesus rose for me. He suffered for me. He died for me. He rose for me, for my salvation, so that I could be made right with God. The only way to be made right with God is through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the resurrection is the key to all this. Because some of y'all are like, well, I mean, if, if Jesus had to die to pay for our sin, how do we know that his sacrifice satisfied God the Father? How do we know the death of Jesus was acceptable to the Father as payment for our sin? How do we know that, Kev? How do we know that? Because he rose. The resurrection was God the Father saying, amen, I accept this payment. My wrath is satisfied for sin. This validates who Jesus is, and I have accepted the payment that he has made for the price for the sin of the world. The resurrection is the key to it all. Skeptical people, and there's some here. I mean, it's Easter, I know. Skeptical people say stuff like this, like, I mean, if there's any kind of mythological teaching within Christianity, I mean, if there's any kind of ultimate, unbelievable miracle, this is it. Like these Christian people believe that their religious leader died and rose from the grave. This is crazy. Matter of fact, here's what I know, dude. When people die, they stay dead. That's what I know. My granny died 14 years ago. She stayed dead. My friend died a few years back. He stayed dead. Like people die, they stay dead, Kev. Resurrection is absolutely impossible. And it's funny you should say that because the New Testament looks at it from a completely different perspective. In Acts chapter 2, verse 24, it says, God raised him from the dead, freeing from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. You say it's impossible for him to be resurrected. No, no, no. Actually, the New Testament says it's impossible that he wouldn't be resurrected. Death had no claim over Jesus. Death is the punishment for sin. The wages of sin is death. Jesus was sinless. How could death have any kind of right or claim over Jesus? You say, well, he took on our, yeah, he took on our sin, but he had no sin of his own. So how could death hold a sinless person? How could death hold God in human flesh? The answer, it couldn't. It couldn't. He lived to fulfill all righteousness for us. He lived the life that we can't and couldn't live. Then he suffered for us. Then he died to pay for our sins. And then he rose again for our salvation. You know what we call that in Christianity? 
the gospel. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. This is what Paul said. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance. Y'all get a first. People are like, what's the biggest deal in Christianity? Like, what's the most important? Like, should you drink alcohol? Should you not drink alcohol? Like, should, should you do this? Should you do that? Can you dance in church? Should you not? None of that's important. Here's the most important thing within Christianity, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, like the Old Testament said he would, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scripture. That's the most important thing in Christianity. That's the gospel. So the question is this. I'm not asking your neighbor. I'm not asking who you came with. I'm not asking what you think about your mom or your friend. I'm asking you personally, how do you respond to the gospel? How do you respond to the resurrection? Do you believe it? Do you doubt it? Let me say this. Doubt's not a bad thing if you're an honest doubter. If you're an honest doubters are actually looking for some answers. And let me tell you, if you're an honest doubter and you're looking for answers about the resurrection, there are good explanations and answers that can satisfy your curiosity and quell your doubt. It's up to you to go and find them. Like, we've got answers. But do you believe it? Do you doubt it? Or do you disbelieve it? And let me kind of throw this in here. Do you trust in it? Because it's possible to believe Jesus rose from the dead intellectually. The demons believe Jesus rose from the dead. Satan believes Jesus rose from the dead. So what we've got to understand, it's not just about intellectually believing that he rose from the dead. That's the start of it. The, the second and most important part is choosing to place your trust in that. Taking it from an intellectual agreement that he rose from the dead and pivoting and saying, you know what? I'm making the choice to trust in his death for my sin and resurrection for my salvation. I'm choosing to trust that. See, some of you in here believe it, but you've never trusted it. And, and that type of belief will not get you to heaven. Believing in Jesus means trusting in what he did, in who he is and what he did. You got to move from intellectual agreement that we call belief into faith. Will you do that today? Will you receive this or will you reject this? It's the most important decision you'll ever make, I'm telling you right now. And I know everybody's fired up about Easter and Easter traditions and, and mama's ham and granny's cornbread and so-and-so's pinto beans and this and that. Y'all eat pinto beans? I know everybody's fired up about Easter tradition, okay? I'm a Vol basketball fan and I'm fired up about our Elite Eight game today to get to the Final Four where we're going to whip Purdue. And I plan on watching it, Okay? But listen, none of that is more important today than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, in a hundred years from now, it's not going to matter if Tennessee won today. It's not going to matter how good mama's ham was today. In a hundred years from now, all that matters to you is what did you do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Did you believe it and trust in it? Or did you just reject it? Will you receive that today? John 1, 2 says, to all who received him, he gave the authority to be called children of God. You got to receive it by faith. Jesus endured the wrath of God so that you could enjoy the grace of God. He suffered death so that you could have life. He was separated from the Father so that you could be reconciled to the Father. He took our place 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin, so that in him, in what he did, we can become the righteousness of God. Trust in Jesus today. Give your life to Jesus today. Worship him today. If you've never done that, I'd like to invite you to do that right now this morning.
right there in your chair. You can choose. You don't have to talk to a preacher. Now, if you want to talk to me, you got some questions, you got that, I'd love to speak to you. Don't think this is something that I can give you. It's nothing that I can give you. Nobody in here can give it to you. This is a faith thing. And you can make that choice right now as you sit in the chair you sit in. I'd like to invite you to do that today if you've never done it. For those of us that have made the choice to trust in Jesus, in his death, and his resurrection, let's celebrate the resurrection. We got an opportunity to stand. I'm going to pray in just a second. We're going to stand. We're going to be able to sing about our hope. A couple more songs before we leave here today, okay? Everybody has a response to what you've just heard. Now, some of our responses are different. The question is, will you respond how God's laid on your heart to respond? Whether it's to be saved, whether it's to stand and worship if you've already been saved, or whether it's come to the altar and pray or praise, whatever it is, will you respond appropriately how God is leading you to, to respond? I'm going to pray, and then you're going to get your chance to respond. Lord, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for letting us be able to see just the journey of Jesus through the Passion Week and and then to focus on um, the crucifixion and, and celebrate the resurrection. Lord, you are our hope, Jesus. If your death and resurrection can't get me into heaven, I'm not getting into heaven because that's the only thing I'm banking on, Lord. And I pray that for somebody here that's never trusted in Jesus this morning, this would, be the, this would be the day. This would be the day of salvation for them. And Lord, for those that have trusted, I pray that you give us a fresh passion for Jesus and appreciation for what he's done for us. Lord, we're just saying what he's done, what he's, well, what did he do? He died for us. He rose again so that we can be forgiven and made right in your eyes, God. Spend eternity in heaven when we pass from this life. I just pray that you would use our time together right now. I pray that you would work in people's hearts through your spirit. And I pray that above all, Lord, you're glorified in our time of response as we sing, as we praise, and as someone is saved this morning, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Every weapon that's formed The thief and his plans will pass over When he sees the red on the door I bleed the blood And I bleed the blood of Jesus I bleed the blood I plead the blood of Jesus The enemy can't take my family Cause this home belongs to the Lord And I'm not afraid to remind has no claim in this war. I plead the blood, and I plead the blood of Jesus. It's more than enough, and I plead the blood of Jesus. My future is glory to glory My 
nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. What can they be whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. Nothing can force in a tone. Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. Nothing good that I have done. Nothing but the blood. What can wash away? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. What can make me hold again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood. Nothing can for sin atone. Nothing but the
every voice, come on. The Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise the Permission. I'm looking at Chuck now. 
with his permission, I'd just like to tell you that we had a man make a profession of faith this morning. And really? No Ric Flair woo? I, fi- I mean, you're the I'm event. for you to finish. Well, give us a woo. Woo! There you go. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. A profession of faith. Man, that's what I've been praying for all week. Uh, it's good to see God be faithful and, and answer prayer. And so uh, I hope you're encouraged, Christians. Um, Easter doesn't stop today, though, right? I mean, this is a lifestyle. This is a resurrection that we celebrate um, all the time. So um, let's go out. Let's live for Jesus. Let's be the followers he's called us to be. And uh, let's bring glory to uh, his name, okay? Um, for some of y'all, man, we got some visitors here. I just want you to know, we meet every Sunday morning at 1030, okay? Starting back next week, we've had 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. services last week and this week. Next week, we'll be back to 1030 a.m., okay? So if you get here at 9, you'll be here by yourself with the worship team as they practice. If you get here at 11, you'll be 30 minutes late. So remember, 1030 next week. We got a regular week this week, women's Bible study Monday, men's Bible study Tuesday, Wednesday night, uh, meal, Bible study, students, D groups, all that stuff going on Wednesday. The only real announcements that I have is no students tonight. Students, y'all hang out with your parents tonight, do the Easter thing, um, eat grandma's ham and all that stuff. Uh, And then the last, last announcement is we have a partnership class next Sunday immediately following service. So we'd like to feed you. If you're like, hey, I've been looking for a church or hey, I've been coming here for a while, but I'd like to partner with this church. Um, we'd be glad to have you and feed you immediately following the service next week. We'll tell you who we are, or what we're about as a church. Uh, the only thing we ask of you is to please go online, harvestpointchurch.net, and sign up for the partnership class so that we know how much food we need to have. So that's next week, immediately following the service. Okay? He's risen. All right, Pinto let's... beans are good, by the way. Huh? Pinto beans are good, by the way. I don't Pinto know what you're be- talking about. Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pinto, you want to you wanna pray us out? All right, let's pray, y'all. Father God, man, it's such a privilege, honor, Lord, to be here, to worship you, God. Like Kev said, we get to do this stuff, Lord. It's so awesome that you give us the ability to do it, Lord. Um, Lord, one profession of faith is enough. One's enough. Thank you so much. But your son came and died on the cross so we all could be reconciled. Um, So, Lord, I just pray that the seed was planted today. I know the gospel was proclaimed and preached So I pray that it planted some seeds, Lord. Um, Lord, just protect these folks as they go out through their day, through their week, Lord. Keep them safe on their way home. Lord, we love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.